I wanted to talk today pretty much about um, something that has is we've all been affected by or touched in some way, shape, or form, and that's that's COVID, post COVID, because the church has not come back the same way that the church started COVID with, and it's, so it's different. We're having to learn, relearn things, do things differently. Uh, church attendance has not come back really anywhere to the levels it was. Uh, we go from having several youth to not having but just uh, three or four youth sometimes. Children's ministry, people with children didn't come back. They were the last ones to come back. Uh, and senior adults, we don't see as many of our senior adults. So it, things have changed a lot. And the church, church in general, the church at large, I'm not singling us out. The church at large today is struggling with what do we do? Well, when we have questions in our life about what we should do, we, ne we need to go to Scripture and see what God says we should do. And so the passage I'm going to be looking at this morning is Romans 12. Like I said, I can't promise you 45 minutes, but Romans 12. And um, I have used this, I've used this before. I have used this, this passage before. I found that when the church needs to kind of refocus, that this is a great passage to, to look at. And so we're going to give attention to, first thing we're going to look at today on getting back on track post-COVID, that's the name of the message, uh, is the fact that, you know, we, I can give an encouraging word today. And uh, a lot of this starts with individual responsibility. Uh, when the church is right, when the people are right, the church will be right. When the pastor's right, the church will be right. When the staff is right, the church will be right. When, 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 you, when we are where we need to be with God, we'll be right. And um, so this first section I call, Give Attention to Your Spiritual Walk, Make Needed Repairs. And it starts in Romans chapter 12, verses 1, verses tw tw verse 12, chapter 12, verse 1. There we go. There we go. Now I've noticed some of y'all do that kind of stuttering, Okay. <laughs> But anyway, it says, the Scriptures say, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's pray. Father, I pray now that you take this, this message that you have given to me, Father, what you've laid on my heart. Father, I know you've not given it to me, to, Lord, just to, for my benefit, but God, it's to be shared. And Father, I pray that everyone now will turn their attention to what you have to say. Father, I pray that there will be no distractions. I pray, God, that my voice will be smooth. I pray my voice will hold out. Father, I pray that you will speak through me, and Lord, it will be your words and not mine. And I pray that with all sincerity, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the first thing I like to do is do kind of a Bible study. I like to just talk about the Scriptures as we go through. To me, that's the, best, the easiest way for me to learn is verse by verse and, and passage by passage. So uh, the first thing we see in, this, in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, therefore. Well, when you say therefore, you've got to look back because something else has already happened. And so Paul, what Paul has been talking to the Roman church about is the fact that uh, Jews and Gentiles, first of all, are welcome in the kingdom of God, but also that... Um, not just Jews and Gentiles, but law versus grace. Uh, Jews, are, Jews were under the, under the thought that, you know, if I can work my way into heaven, I can be good enough, and I, God will let me into heaven. Folks, there's people all over the world that think that. But also, they, they, they wanted to try to, to make the Gentiles do all the Jewish rituals and everything. So that's, that's what Paul's been talking about for all this time. And he's, he's come to the point of resolution there, and he says, therefore, therefore, look back. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. And he has, he has established with him the fact that God in mercy, God in mercy sent Jesus to us on the cross that he would die for our sins. So it, that's what God does for us before we're saved. And so he says that I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. A living sacrifice is in contrast with uh, the Old Testament sacrifices of blood. So what we're seeing here is the fact that he's, he's setting them up to know where to start, where to start, what to do first. Uh, he says, this is your true and proper worship. Well, how are we to worship God? You know, when I was a kid at Corinth, and we went to worship every Sunday. And I was a kid and I thought, they call it worship. I said, well, when does worship happen? Does it happen when we sing? Does it happen when we read the scriptures? I thought, well, when does it happen? As they say we do it, you know, because I had pictures of worship back on you know, bound down and all that stuff. But we worship him in spirit and in truth, in relationship with God. 
He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. To not conform means not to be formed in another image. We are supposed to be trying to become like Jesus, to be in the image of Christ. Yet there's all kinds of things today that make it hard to conform to His image. And then He says, but be transformed. Now, all right, I'll transform here. The word is transformed, not transitioning. We're not changing our sex. We're not changing our gender. We're not changing any of these things. He's not talking about that kind of transition. You've got to be careful nowadays. You know, I'm still identifying as a he. I've not caught up with all this other stuff. But, but he says, do not conform to, the, conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. Uh, let's turn to Colossians chapter 3. He says, do not conform. We've talked about the fact that they're not to sin, that they're to be living sacrifice, give their life every day for Christ. But what is renewing of our mind? Colossians 3, verses 1 through 4. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds. Set your mind. That talks about a determination that I'm going to do what I should do. Now, you know, it's hard. I, I, read, I read the Scripture, try to read the Scripture every morning. But I have to set my mind to do that to make sure I'm going to do it. I have to push myself. I have to keep myself accountable. And this is one of the good things about small groups, folks, is there's accountability built into it. And people, people are more likely to do what they're supposed to do when we're held accountable. But he says to set our minds on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden in Christ with God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. And he starts there talking about the fact we set our minds and then it ends up we end up in glory. But it's a lifelong, it's a lifelong thing to do. It's something we ought to do every day. It's being in the Scriptures, be praying. So, he next says, the next thing we see here is, uh, when you your mind, then you will be able to test and prove. Do, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Well, it's set up here, talked about holy and pleasing to God. And so the next thing we're looking at in Colossians is holy and pleasing to God. Now, what, we, know what, we know holiness is to be pure. But, you know, have we really defined what holiness is? It's not. Holiness is not my picture of what goodness is. Holiness is God's picture. What is sin? God establishes what sin is. Now, now tell me if this does not kind of look like we, what we have today in this world. He tells us in Colossians 3, verse 5, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry, because of these, wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, the, the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek, Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. So we see to be transformed there. We set our minds on above. We know what sin is. We keep sin confessed. We try to learn to, we try to live without sin. And then we come to worship Him. But the thing it says that here that's interesting is test and approve what God's will is. How do we know what God's will is if we don't look in the Bible? Now, I've had people come to me for advice on every number of things. When you're an associate pastor, you, get, you give advice to everybody. And, and so I have people come to me, ask all kinds of questions and everything, and it's like, what should I do? And it's like, well, I can't tell you what to do. This is something, a decision you need to make. Or, you know, of course, I give advice on cars and on appliances and, uh, uh, you know, relationships. You're not dealt with anything until you've dealt with a teenage relationship. But, uh, t t relationship. But anyway... Uh, Read this verse once again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So let me ask you a question, something to think about. You don't have to answer. I, I wouldn't know what to do if you did answer. So, <laughs> How much attention do we give to our spiritual walk? How important is that? Are we once a, once a week folks that you know just come on Sunday, may come to Sunday school on a day or two? Are, are we doing anything with our spiritual life at home? Are we who we need to be in the family? Are we a people of prayer? You know, I heard about this about a pastor one time said that uh, you get so busy. You know, that, that's, where, that's where prayer gets taken a lot of times. We get so busy. That's our excuse. But he said he saw a woman and uh, he said he had told her to pray for her. And he said, yeah, I would pray for her. And so uh, then he said next week when he met her down the hall, said, Look, oh, there's so-and-so. Lord, be with so-and-so. Hey, I've been praying for you. When do we, when do we get diligent in prayer? In a crisis? Where are we when things are going good? What about our love for the Word? And that's another thing that our time, our time gets taken of. Have you ever been closer to God than you are right now? Post-COVID, what would we say? Probably not. What are we going to do with that? Well, the first thing is to give attention to our spiritual walk and make the needed repairs. You can do this. I hope you will do this. I'm working on it. But the next thing we see is to serve the Lord with gladness, to serve. One of the things, we establish our, reestablish our spiritual walk, and then we get back to it, to serve. Now, you've heard the thing about the 20% do the work and 80% just kind of watch, and, and that may or may not be true. I don't know. But what we look at is the fact that you know, there are things for us to do. Service is not an option. Paul said, "For by the grace, this is verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and those many members form one body, and each member belongs to all the others, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with the word, in, excuse me, in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So what he's starting to talk about here is the fact that you know, we're all given gifts. We're all given, ta all, all given skills that we can use for the kingdom of God. Now, this doesn't talk about everybody's got to have a weekly job in the church. Everybody's got to be on this committee, that committee. It's not talking about that. But what it's talking about is there are gifts that we all have to, uh, that we all can offer at different times and places. And I'm just going to bring, he's, he's not here. But uh, if you've ever been around Daniel Parsons, you know, he's, Daniel's just different. But he's a great guy, and he's helped me several times on things that I need help on. And a lot of people don't know that he does stuff like that for people. Uh, David Winters is another one. David Winters is, works an odd shift. He's not able to be here. But David Winters has helped me with a lot of things in, in the time that he has. And the poor man works at night. He's supposed to sleep during the day. But he, he'll be up doing what he needs to do. You know, there's just people like that around the church that are always willing to do something. Think about Deborah Palmer and the stuff. I mean, you just mentioned a need and she's going to be. But Deborah's not teaching Sunday school. She's not singing in the choir. She's maybe on a committee or two. But just in any number of you guys, I could, I could say that about. I mean, I've got people who show up just to go on youth trips with us. And, and that helps. I don't need them all the time. Don't need 25 people up there with youth. But, you know, sometimes we need help. And you're able to do that. That is where it's at. Sometimes you may be that one person that somebody feels comfortable with that you can minister to. And it may not be that anybody else ever talks to you, but this, this one person may just feel a, a kinship. And our, Laura, our secretary, 
has talked about that. Somebody come into her and said, didn't want to speak to the pastor, want to speak to her. And then and, and, and told her what was going on. And so she did some right on the job counseling right there. So, you know, we've all got something we can offer. And so he says there, in accordance, uh, we all have different gifts according to the grace given to you. If your gift is prophesying, prophesy. And that would translate out in our, our language to one word would be preaching, sharing the word. If it is serving, then serve. Some people just need to be available to help with things. I mean, it's, I mean, setting up tables outside, setting up sound outside, cooking, arranging, serving than serve. If it is teaching, then teach. And I can't say enough about this. More people have the, the gift of teaching than are using it. I just say that's it's like that in every church. We always need teachers. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. Now I've decided, you know, if I can't do anything, I can at least be kind. I can at least be kind. I don't care if you're a Democrat, Republican. I don't care if you're Jew, Gentile. I don't care if you're LBGTQ, RSTUV, W, X, Y. I don't care. I mean, I, I, I can be kind to anyone. I can. And, you know, I can't keep up with all those letters, and I don't know what they mean. So, all of them. So. <laughs> uh, if it's courage and courage, if it's giving, then give cheer generously. What, what about being behind the scenes? It's just giving to make sure that there's money there to do what needs to be done. There are people that do that. And God blesses them, and they and really blesses us. If it is to lead, do it diligently. Leaders, we need leaders. We're trying to develop leaders in the youth group. Kids that take initiative to do, take responsibility for things. It's important. But God has given us all, all these things to do and to work with, and yet we're not doing anything. And I, I'm talking collective to the church at large, okay? We, we have a lot of good working people here. A lot of people that are using their gifts. But that's, that's not what's happening everywhere. And I, say, I dare not say that there's not somebody here today that, that could step up and do something. We've considered that service is not an option. But I want to ask you this. Now, this, is, this gets to your heart. Do you serve Christ out of a sense of duty or love? This goes back to people who say they know Christ, that they know of Him. But they, the relationship has got to be there. Be in a relationship. It's not about me going to heaven. It's about me loving Christ. I'm going to heaven. I'm glad I'm going to heaven as opposed to the other place. But it's about the growth in that relationship. Serving is a way to be the hands and feet of Jesus. I mean, could God just will everything done? Of course He could. But it is a privilege a privilege to serve God. It is a joyful privilege to serve God. Well, he's not finished. Paul, not. I'm not talking about me, Paul. Not only should we serve the Lord, we should serve the Lord with, great, with gladness. And here's more about attitude. Now, here's where Paul hits, hits it pretty hard. Bless those who persecute you. Right. That, doesn't, that doesn't jive with what today's world is. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. And you don't, you don't know what that means. I mean, somebody will mourn with you. Live in harmony with one another. One another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. I think in our hearts there ought to not be anybody looked at as being in low position because of the worth God gives us. We are worth something in God's eyes. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath for it is written. It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, do what? Feed him. Feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. 
Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Shouldn't that be something we think about every day before we walk out the door? Let me ask you this question. Do you think that is just how we're supposed to treat Christians or are we supposed to treat lost people that way too? Both. Both of them. So in other words, we need to treat everybody good. Also included in that, I'm just going to kind of add this as a side. When he's talking about all that as far as overcoming evil, what do you think about forgiveness there? Being a part of that? I know so many people who have hurts, wounds, pains, and they hold on to it like, like nearly being codependent. And it's, it'll drive you crazy if you, don't, if you hold unforgiveness, if you hold grudges. But yet people do. This next verse is kind of where, where I got going on this uh, subject, where God really spoke to me. It's ch chapter 12, verse 9 through 13. It says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Now what we see there is a, tr and I have entitled this one, Spend Time with Family. That's, that's us, family. And I'll tell you a story. Well, first I'll tell you, I love my family at home. I love Beth and the girls. And just, but I'm a daddy. And my youngest daughter's getting married next March, March 25th. And there's a, this young guy, this young man hanging around the house that's going to marry my, my daughter. Really, the folks, the example I got thinking about is how we have accepted Cole, how Cole has just become a member of our family. Now, he's had, he's had good raising, he's a good boy. Good, good man. But, you know, he's, he's just one of us now. Just one of us. And, and it's... When you start mentioning family with the church, people, their, their eyebrows go because sometimes that means a clique. A closed, enclosed group that nobody can be a part of. That's not what our church needs to be. And our church is not. I'm going to say in, in 21 years, this has never been a cliquish church. Has never been a cliquish church. Has not been a troubled church. Has not been. But I grew up in a cliquish church. And there's so many times I, I felt like I was sitting on the outside and, and I wanted to be on the inside so bad. Just want to be a part. Let me help. Give me the opportunity. And a youth leader did finally give me the opportunity and that's where the trombone came and all this kind of stuff and I got to be a part of the church. But it took forever. And that's not the way it's supposed to be as far as cliquish. But we, I had a conversation with Ethan Elder. Now, y'all know Ethan. Tall kid, about yay tall. Very inquisitive. Well, Ethan texted me one night. You know, nobody calls on the phone. They take the text or something. And you all try to get a hold of the, all the kids that get to do one on Instant Messenger, two or three on text. Some of them still do email. And it's hard to get a hold of the kids. But he texted me one night and said, we, when can we do a lock-in? Okay, now I've got an average of four or five kids coming every week, okay? It's like, okay. He said, we could, invite, we could get people to come, and they'd come to it, and we'd have fun, and, you know, and we'd have a good crowd at church, have a good crowd. And we, we went back and forth. First of all, it's, it's close to Christmas. I'm working on music. I, I can't do a lock-in right now. Some of y'all look like you'd enjoy a lock-in. <laughs> Melba, Melba stays up, up all night. It's, for some reason, it doesn't seem to bother her at all. I'm dead for three days after. But do, do a lock-in. And you know, lock-in, this one comedian says, lock-in is taking all the pre-hormonal or hormonal kids and putting them in a, a church and locking the door. So there's a lot of wisdom in that, isn't there? <laughs> you know, but anyway. But he, um, 
I said, well, Ethan, I said, I can't do it right now. I said, but I'm, I'm kind of evaluating how I wanted, what I want to do. He said, well, we'd have a good crowd. I said, yeah, we'd have a good crowd. I said, we did a, did a lock-in about this time last year. And I said, we had a great crowd. We did a half lock-in. That was very ingenious on my part. Didn't have to spend the night at church. I said, we'll, we'll have, he said, well, we'll have people. I said, but, but we had a crowd. We had a big crowd. I mean, we were just amazed at the people that come, the children that come. Next Wednesday night, four. And I don't know where this came from. God must have gave it to me or something. It had to be because I'm not that smart. I said, you know, we, we make a mistake as, ch as churches, as groups, because we're all about building a crowd. Building a crowd. Well, you can build a crowd. You can bring in circus acts and everything else, and you can build a crowd. You can have a singing every two weeks, and you can have a crowd. I said, Ethan, what we need to do is, and he's talking about, well, dude, just give us an opportunity to, to invite. I said, of all the kids you invited last time, I said, 99% of them saved. I said, they're, they're in churches. I said, that's not who we need to talk to. I said, but we had this other list of four or five kids that were lost. That we, I worked them. I worked on them. Talked to them. And I said, y'all didn't talk to them. Well, they don't go to church. Well, that's the whole idea. But folks, we're not looking to build a crowd. We can load the place up with people today. But what we are trying to do is trying to build family. Family. I said, I said let's look, look, look at it like this, Ethan. I said, family stays. So everybody wants a good family. Everybody wants to feel a part of a family. And over the years, the kids that we've got, a lot of them have trouble in their families. And so we have tried to provide stability in the youth ministry to, to overcome a lot of that. And those that have worked with the youth know what I'm talking about. But family, family's where it's at. We, we need to build our church as a family, and, a, and not a closed cliquish group, but a family where, where people can feel safe, can feel apart, can feel encouraged, can, can take all the blessings that we have to offer. And that's just been on my heart. Just, and I've, I've basically changed. We're, we're doing a youth retreat. And I've said there's 16 people going. That's all's going. I'm not taking more trouble than I need. Because sometimes, I mean, there's some kids. I've got to get out of the house over the holidays. Got to get out of the house over the holidays. Uh, that church is going someplace. I think I'll go with them. And then you end up not accomplishing a lot. But family. Family's important to all of us. I've been getting a lot of encouragement personally lately. And uh, I was touched by somebody who had, had just heard I needed prayer. And uh, they live in Tennessee and I hadn't heard from them in a while that uh, sent me a message last week. Said, praying for you. I just, you know, we're just praying for you, all this kind of stuff. He said, and if you need anything, call on us. Said, we're, we're family. I ain't related to that person. Our kin and folk have never cohabitated or anything like that. But she said we're family. And I thought, you know, she's right. She's in Tennessee. Used to sing with a girl. Just a very good friend. She calls and checks on Jason sometimes. We write something on Facebook. So that's when we check on Jason. But family. And you know what? There's coming a family reunion one day. And it's not going to be here, is it? Some people think it is. They're going to be very surprised. Family, the family gathering is going to be in heaven. The thing is, this, this is all a training ground for heaven. When my mother passed away, my grandmother looked at the looked at the situation as far as having to watch her child pass away. And just something, something peaceful came to my mind. It was, uh, you know, we don't gather here. We don't gather here. This is just a temporary thing. That's how I endure it. It's just temporary. But heaven's forever. Heaven's forever. We'll gather there. And it's going to be a grand, grand celebration.